Well, hello class. Here we are with uh, Chapter 8, Supplier Quality Management. Another one of my favorite chapters. You may not believe that, but I really like this stuff. This is stuff that I concentrated on in my PhD program, that is. Well, let's start. First of all, what is supplier quality? Well, we see that little sign there, uh, the ribbon. Number one. It's the ability to meet or exceed current and future customer expectations or requirements within critical performance areas on a consistent basis. Okay, look at what we mean by that. Meet or exceed, yeah, the wow factor. They are going to always be there with good quality. And it's right now on our requirements and in the future. And they're going to do it consistently. This is important. Well, of course, it's in the book. <laughs> it should be. It ought to be. Well, let's move on. Well, what are the uh, factors? Well, supply management's role. The first thing is, is the ability of a supplier to affect a buyer's total quality. Yes, garbage in, garbage out. If we get bad stuff from a supplier, it's going to affect our total quality system. Also another uh, factor is the resources available to support supplier quality improvement. Do you have the people? Do you have the know-how? Do you have other resources in your organization? Do you have a good HR department that is going to support with training, that is going to be involved in team building, and so on and so forth? Does uh, top management su uh, support this? The third bullet talks about the ability of a buying firm to practice world-class quality. They need, if they're going to be a world-class company, that's us, you know, the buying company, well, our suppliers need to feed us with just the right stuff, what we need, good quality. Another factor is a buyer's willingness to work jointly with the buyer to improve quality. Um, I've seen this in organizations where sometimes suppliers say, you know what, you represent such a small portion of, of what I supply, I just don't have time or the, the, the desire to work with you, and uh, you may want to look elsewhere. And that could happen. You want to know that. You don't want to have promises and then later on find out that the supplier isn't willing to work with you. One way to do that is to take a look at their current quality level. If they're producing good quality, hey, there's chances are that they can move on to even higher levels and or be consistent. If it's already there, that's a good sign. And one of the uh, parts of this is the buyer's ability to go into a supplier to collect and analyze quality-related data. If they will not let you in the door or they're very sensitive about what they show you, you don't want to work with them. Now, one of the important things is a TQM perspective. Your organization should have one. If you don't get one, you shouldn't be in the, in the business of, of requesting and expecting good quality from your supplier if you're not already doing it in-house. Now, there's a whole list of items here that, that cover a, a wide range of, of uh, topics uh, within your textbook. First thing is, Defining quality in terms of customers and their requirements. Your customer is the one who says, this is what I expect. And there are various definitions of what quality is. Ask them. Don't define it for them. Ask them to define quality. Deming's 14 points are a good place to start also. Um, they're, they're very good. It's a part of a philosophy. It's an organizational philosophy that you may want to to uh, to adopt now I'll say this is that some of the 14 points that Deming's uh, that Deming puts out they sometimes contradict points or, or view, philosophy viewpoints that other de uh, gurus have had for example let's let's say that that uh, Crosby says that quality is free Deming might say hey no slogans and so you're caught in, caught in a quandary you know I have these two guys that are you know uh, fighting it out. <laughs> of course, Deming's already dead, uh, but philosophically, you know, afterwards he's still he's still fighting it out. 
Another thing is pursuing quality at the source. And that is with your supplier is ask for good quality. And they're going to be buying quality further down in their supply chain too. How far along the supply chain are you able to have, and I'm not saying control, but influence. Um, one of the things too that you need to look at is objective measurement and analysis is that you're working like scientists. Eliminate bias eliminate poor or shoddy uh, uh, measurement and, and analysis and, and science, get rid of that. Go with objective measurement and analysis. Another thing is to emphasize prevention of, of uh, problems rather than detection of defects. Prevention means that, that your line workers, they have been trained in quality prevention. Uh, by the way, Duran has a, a, uh, a pretty interesting chart where he talks about the external cost of quality, the internal cost of quality, uh, detection of defects, and then finally prevention costs. And these four costs, they range from very high to the lowest ones, which is prevention. And you do that by focusing on process rather than on the output. And you also, in our textbook, there is a, 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 a the, the basics for process capability. Uh, and there's a quantitative process on, uh, and, and it's not rocket science. And in fact, a lot of this can be used with tables if, if you don't feel comfortable uh, training your workers with, with statistics. But anyway, it's very doable. What you are doing is striving for zero defects. Again, we go for uh, a slogan that Deming would be, uh, if he could come out of the grave, he'd be upset at. You establish a culture of continuous improvement. Uh, the Japanese word kaizen, they have one word for it. And here we have to say continuous improvement. When we say kaizen, we should know what it means is that we just don't stop. When we have good quality, we continue with even better quality. And we make sure that it is everybody's responsibility within the organization. No finger pointing, no pointing to some other department. You say, yeah, we're doing quality and everybody's responsible for it. Now, another way to go about this, and these, these uh, models that we're looking at are not mutually exclusive, and sometimes one builds on another. Here you have the DMAIC model, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And it's a very good uh, method, and there's, uh, I think that it complements what we saw in the previous model with TQM. In fact, you can have this as part of your, your uh, TQM process, because here you don't get into uh, the notion of organizational culture. You don't get into the notion of, of uh, talking to the customer, and there's a lot of other things. So the DMIC, DMAIC model can fit under your TQM program, too. Here are two others, uh, ISO 9000 and 14000, and the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. Now, ISO was originally developed in the European common market. We like it so much that, that in the U.S. we have become, or we have began to not began, in fact, it's it's been going on for quite a few years, is that we go ahead and use the ISO uh, certifications. Now, what companies do, a supplier would do, is they'd go with a third-party registration process. They'd go to a consultant who would go through and, and help them to to um, oh, quantify and, and write down what their quality processes are. A problem with ISO that I have found is that sometimes companies uh, they, they uh, work entirely with the consultant and they don't have their people inside of the organization go through the process. And so before you know it, it ends up being a nice certificate that you have on the wall and people say, hey, you, you're ISO 9000 certified, but yet your employees in the back, they don't know anything or they know very little about what's uh, involved in putting the manuals together. They haven't internalized the quality uh, program. Now here you have the principles of ISO 9000. It's customer focus, yay, that's part of TQM. 
leadership, which is an important aspect, your involvement of people there, you get into the, your culture and, and, and empowerment. And it's a process approach. It's not about end, uh, you know, end of process uh, measurements, which would be, you know, the old style of, of, uh, of quality. We're working with TQM. That's about working with the process and it's systematic. And, and we also have management, top management supporting this. If they don't support it, it isn't going to work. Continuous improvement, again, here it shows up, the Kaizen uh, approach. Here we call it factual approach to decision making, you know, the science where we're unbiased, where we, we actually go in and, and do objective measurements. And we have supplier partnerships. Those are the eight principles of ISO 9000 colon 2000. That means it was, it was updated in the year 2000. These are new principles not the old 1994 per, uh, version. Now, buyers benefit from ISO 9000 because, you know, firms sometimes don't have enough resources to develop and implement their own, you know, supplier certification audits. Um, often, uh, the supplier assumes responsibility for meeting the ISO 9000 standards and paying for its own registration fees. And the supplier demonstrates higher quality. I would say, and this is my own opinion, is that ISO 9000 is the beginning. If they have gone this far, then I would suggest that the company take them a little bit further and you go with your own quality supplier certification or your own audit that follows on top. Use the ISO 9000 as a beginning point, but build upon it. I wouldn't rely entirely on ISO 9000. Now, the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award uh, was something that was implemented in 1987 during the Reagan administration. I believe that was Reagan. And there was a recognition that in the U.S. we were suffering from bad quality. It recognizes TQM and a competitive set of criteria. It is more comprehensive than ISO 9000, and it implies that organization excels not just in quality management, but in the achievement of quality. You see, when we looked at ISO 9000, it looks at process, but the MBQ, the MBNQA, it also looks at achievement, and not just quality achievement, but financial achievement. Are you making money? If Let's say that you have high quality, but not making money, but what use is it? And um, much of the current application is for internal use as a quality management tool and not for award purposes. That means if you go through the whole process, let's say, and you apply for the prize and you don't win the award or something, well, who cares? I mean, yes, that's nice, but just the the the, the fact that you went through and used it as a as a quality improvement tool is great, and it it really does take it to ten years to adequately prepare a competitive quality system. It doesn't happen overnight, and it's built upon a continuous improvement philosophy and culture it's not listed there but it ought to be and it is process and results oriented which is let's see um i thought we talked about that already oh in the third bullet that it's quality but and uh management but achievement now the criteria items that you look for are leadership strategic planning customer and market focus, information and analysis, human resource focus, yes, they're involved here because you need to build teams and, and to train your employees, process management, and finally, the most heavily weighted one is business results. Yes, all of the others have points but the, awarded to them, but the last one, business results, is the most important.